Today, we are very lucky to be joined by one of Brisbane's leading entrepreneurs, Melissa Witheriff, on building her career as an entrepreneur, creating multidisciplinary teams based on a culture of innovation, and daring to be different and pushing the boundaries relative to the business environment. Melissa worked in almost every state government department imaginable over an impressive 14 year period before joining CUA, where she's now the head of digital innovation for CUA Next. And she's also an, an advisory board member for UQ's Service Innovation Alliance Advisory Board. Try saying that quickly. With extensive experience in commercial, government, and not for profit sectors, Melissa has a strong track record in emerging technologies such as AI and machine learning, business model innovation human-centered design, fintech startup investment, accelerated programs, cultural change, portfolio change management, and leading business and people transitions. And we couldn't be lucky to have her here today as our industry expert. So here's how today is gonna to work. We will watch Melissa's insightful 30 minute presentation, which we recorded earlier this week. And then Melissa and I are gonna jump back on here for a live chat and answer all of your questions. And with that, let the webinar begin. I'll see you guys soon. Imagine it's the year 2020. You live in a world where there's a global pandemic spreading rapidly. It's creating both health and economic chaos across the globe. The virus spreads from person to person, and so governments have essentially stopped people gathering in large groups to flatten the curve. What this means is schools are closed, families are juggling working from home, and also looking after their children in homeschool. Beaches are closed, sporting events are cancelled. People are not eating at restaurants, going out to cinemas or visiting gyms. The anxiety that's brought on because of the rapid spread of the virus has created behavioural changes in people in the way they live, shop and consume goods and it's actually creating hoarding behaviours where households are buying toiletries and things like that. Unemployment is staggering. For example, the travel industry is at a standstill. The impact has been felt acutely through small and medium enterprises. And these types of businesses are rapidly closing their doors, and which is causing economic disruption. The disruption is asymmetrical in that some businesses have never been busier, such as health, workers and delivery services, yet there's others that have had to lay off people and stand down entire workforces. Everyone in the planet is impacted in big and small ways. Good morning. My name is Melissa Witheriff. I'm the Head of Digital Innovation at CUA. You might be wondering why am I telling you this story? You see, 12 months ago, you would have thought 
This sounds like the plot of a Hollywood movie. It would have been a blockbuster or a fairy tale. Yet this is our current reality and the context with which we live and work in. You see, we live in a world of disruption, change and uncertainty. You might say we've been VUCA'd. In a VUCA world, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. It's through storytelling that we understand the complexity of the environment around us or the context that we live in. And it's really about telling stories that we create visibility and certainty in what is a very uncertain future. So the question remains, within this context, how might we transform our organisations from crisis management, business continuity and recovery through to transformational growth? How might we both regenerate and accelerate? The first priority for many organisations has very, been, very much been crisis mode. It's been about looking after their employees and their customers' wellbeing and trying to create, cope with the increase of activity or whether they need to pivot, pivot their business model or the decline of their business. But beyond this point, it's clear that organisations need to actually focus on what It's through the rise of entrepreneurs, through resilience, growth mindset, and new thinking to adapt in big and small ways, that we will be able to not only survive, but thrive through this period of time. It's through experimentation and using new digital tools and business models that we can make the uncertainty certain. So we need to shift to what is our new normal. And whatever our new normal means, our organisations need to find the ways to benefit from the opportunities that come to pass. We know that digital transformation enables new business models and organisations to rethink traditional ways of business and traditional revenue sources and move from core to adjacent to transformational opportunities. In fact, it was the CEO of Microsoft who said last week that he had seen two years of digital transformation in just two months. A culture of experimentation allows us to align our digital innovation and transformation journey at CUA to be the sustainable and differentiated and member organisation we aspire to be. So I work for CUA. So CUA is Australia's largest credit union. We offer both banking and insurance services for about 550,000 Australians. We employ about 1,000 people and our head office is based in Brisbane. So today, I've been asked to share with you my thoughts on how could you become an entrepreneur within your world, within your organisation or within your context? How might you look at proof of concepts and deliver value to your business to go again and to drive new projects? I'm also talking today about how to drive a culture of innovation and also how to navigate through complex stakeholder management. I'm going to talk about how you innovate with a confined budget and we know there will be fiscal challenges ahead. And finally, I'm going to talk about how to navigate an ideal career for yourself within an organisation to ensure everybody wins. So, what's an entrepreneur? Before we go any further, we really need to define what this means to us. So, an entrepreneur is essentially focusing on innovation and creativity. An entrepreneur transforms an idea into a promising venture that has a commercial return while operating within a organisational context. So to become an entrepreneur in your world, you need to focus on what's the most important problem to solve. It makes sense to look beyond the crisis we're currently in and be open to respond to new possibilities. 
With a focus on regeneration and acceleration, I just wanted to share a bit of a framework with you that I think will add some value. So if you're interested in innovation, you may have heard of Doblin's 10 types of innovation model. We can adapt that to the situation we're in now and think about how might we innovate within three categories. The first one being organisational configuration or efficiency. We might think about how could entrepreneurs rework profit models? How could we focus on networks and look at our partnerships in different ways? How might we automate paper processes to enable our people to work from home would be a good example of that. How might we think about our business structures differently or unique processes? The second element in Dublin's model is about products or the market offer. When we think about product performance, we think about differentiation. If you cast your mind to our current environment, the production of respirators, hand sanitizers, and PPE equipment are great examples of how businesses have flexed and exploited the capabilities that they have to be able to meet an unmet need. The third area is customer experience. This is about service, support, looking at ch different channels to market, about brand power and about customer engagement. An example of the opportunity in changing our service delivery model could be through the drive-through medicine where people can be tested for the virus, as well as the spread of telehealth services for allied health workers, workers who offer services in the home through technology, such as speech therapists, psychologists, and occupational therapists. We know that if organisations focus on those three areas, that they are more likely to be successful through this period in terms of how to reinvent their business models uh, to be able to be successful. So as you regenerate, and accelerate out of, out of COVID-19 into the new normal, whatever that will look like for us. We need to think about innovation in terms of organisational efficiency, products, and also the member or customer experience. The second area I wanted to focus on was how might we develop proof of concepts? So I see five steps in developing a proof of concept. The first is about insight. You really need to understand what is the most important problem to solve right now and take advantage of the data that's available to you to help not only make decisions, but also think about what cost savings, what revenue generation opportunities there are, how much you impact the supply chain, chains, and how could you improve uh, revenue generation. The second element to there is ideation. So this is about divergent and convergent thinking. And using tools like human-centered design, looking at the hypothesis you want to solve for, thinking about the customer journey, and understanding empathy mapping. These are important tools to be able to um, not only identify the best ideas, but also make sure that they're relevant for the uh, customers you want to suit. From there, it's about live market experimentation. This is very important to test three things, feasibility, desirability, and viability. And if you want more information, IDEO has a lot of resources in this regard. So desirability, it's basically the demand for services, so creating an engaging uh, customer experience. Feasibility is about testing technically, can this thing be built? Does it adhere to regulatory requirements? Does it uh, fit with data security requirements? The third area is viability. So can it scale? Will it bring a commercial return? Is it a sustainable business model? From there, it's about building that business case, being really clear about what is the return on investment that you might see from this idea. Then you may be funded to then run a more substantial proof of concept. So going out to market, to test, to validate, with the final area being scale. An example of this is CU Angels. 
We had a, a hackathon event. It was 54 hours where our intrapreneurs came together to pitch ideas, solve problems, uh, validate their ideas, uh, and then come up with some insights about how they might do it. And I'd like to show you a video now of just what that experience was like for the entrepreneurs at Seaway. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here this evening for CUA's first ever hackathon. The CUA hackathon is a collision factory between internal staff, external startups, to really go out and test an idea, pitch an idea, and take it all the way through to a prototype, validation, and a business model. The insights and learnings I'm really looking to gain from this is working with the team, seeing how the industry works, and just seeing how innovative banks really want to be. We have some guest speakers come in. We talk about this new customer-centric focus and life events. But then really it's about participants getting up and doing random pitches, open mic pitches about things that they want to see solved. They form teams. And from that point on, they actually have about 48 hours to go out and validate a business and come up with a new product or service. One of my ideas got put up and I've collaborated with two other people that had ideas and we formed a team and that's really exciting. You know, when you get a diverse group of people together to work on ideas, it's incredibly powerful. And we help them along the way. So on the Friday morning, we run some workshops. We've invited members to be right in the centre of our design of products and services that are going to be relevant for them. I think there's some really exciting things being showcased to the members um, and I'd really like to see some of these come about. I arrived here for the focus group. One of the teams really liked my feedback and they asked me to join them. So I've been here since 4 p.m. yesterday, helping them build a prototype for their idea. We bring some mentors in in the afternoon. We actually start in preparation for the final pitch back to a panel of judges. The ambition was strong, the passion was strong, it was all very difficult to do. So congratulations to the CUA Angel. I think there's one pitch that they surveyed 500 people. I've never seen that before at Startup Weekend. That tells me that we've got the, the enthusiasm and the passion to make this happen. We must get onto something here. So the winning idea from the hackathon was a silent account for people going through domestically violent situations. It was built and deployed within nine weeks of the event and it's still in market today, which is a wonderful outcome. The next question I'd like to, uh, to talk about is how might you create a culture of innovation? So a culture of innovation is not just about putting on uh, pizza and having some beers. In a post-COVID world, we need to think about this differently. We need to ensure that our organisations continue to be relevant. It's not about just having the right culture and entrepreneurial mindset, but also the capability to innovate and thinking about broad-based skills that are necessary in terms of design thinking, visual storytelling, customer journey mapping, pitching and presenting, working in agile ways and gamification. And through a power up event that I ran, we were able to take three quarters of our organisation, so we frontline staff right through to some of our senior leaders through training in those capability areas. Also, there's free courses at, at University of Queensland at the moment, for example, where you can develop these skills at home. In a post-COVID world, we need to develop teams of motivated people that aren't afraid to fail fast and that can tackle some of the biggest challenges head on in a collaborative environment. And so you might think, well, how can we do this? So the first thing is we need to have a catalyst or a strategic theme that people will ideate around. The risk of not doing this is that you get a scattergun approach. So it's really important to define clearly what the theme uh, needs to be for the innovation. You need to create spaces and in a post-COVID world it's about creating digital platforms for collaboration using tools like Mural or Zoom and the whiteboard capability there. For projects it's about Confluence, Jira, Google Slides, different technology to collaborate in new ways. It's also important to carve out time to think creatively. 
also. It's about empowerment. And if you've come across the work of Daniel Pink, he talks about three critical elements for people to feel empowered. It's about autonomy, mastery and purpose. It's why people volunteer their time to go to hackathon events and work over the weekends. And um, it's about the adrenaline that keeps them going. Also, the tools we spoke about earlier, human-centered design processes, um, connecting with coaches, um, accessing mentors, that sort of thing is really important to be able to um, assist people to ideate. Another facet is about engaging the member or the customer in the heart of what you do. So running focus groups, engaging members or customers in the co-design processes really make for a much better quality experience at the end. Entrepreneurs will also benefit by accessing data and to be able to have technology environments available to stand up their experiments and proof of concepts. And the last aspect there is about connections, getting the right access to the right leaders to get sponsorship to be able to make these ideas a reality. I'd like to show you now a, a video from the Power Up series with, that we ran. Digimap will result in an 11 minute mind map to leads management system conversion. The way that they've been able to work together and even go outside of the box to bring their ideas to life has been absolutely amazing. Really getting into the member's shoes, in the team member's shoes, just really understanding that and being able to build something that would solve those problems. Very rewarding, very satisfying. Power Up is, you've got this room full of all these outstanding people bringing all these amazing ideas together. We need to leverage these ideas and use them to our competitive advantage, I guess, to help us move forward as a company and stay ahead of the competition and you know keep up in that digital space, which is what we're trying to do. So Power Up, the key learnings there was, it was about having a growth mindset. It was about engaging our people, our entrepreneurs, to think differently and to uh, have be able to innovate every day. So we're aiming to have people not thinking about hacking as just a one day event or a weekend here and there, but it's about creating it as part of a new way of working. The fourth question uh, that I was asked uh, by Holly to respond to was around stakeholder management. It is absolutely critical to get the buy-in of the right people at the senior executive levels to sponsor your idea. The main difference between an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur is that an entrepreneur works for him or herself and can make all the decisions around the product roadmap, and the features. An entrepreneur in an organisation, you need to follow the appropriate channels, get the right buy-in, potentially run through various committees, and work within the company constraints and policies, particularly when they're heavy regulated organisations such as banking and insurance. It's important to share quick wins with these stakeholders to get their buy-in uh, and to um, ensure that those sponsors are informed of your progress at key milestones. Executive sponsors, and it could even be the board, need to be able to espouse a culture of innovation. It's also about setting up the right levels of governance. So you might need to have a steering committee put in place. Need to understand clearly what is the outcome that they are seeking. Is it about commercial outcome? Is it about net promoter score? Is it about new uh, customer acquisition or retention? Is it about uh, process efficiency, reducing costs, or in fact, employee learning and cultural benefits? It is incredibly important to understand what is the key driver so you can set yourself up for success as an entrepreneur. It's also about having their agile processes in place and the right business owner. So when it goes from idea out to scale, that you have the right business owner that can take that idea forward for you and embed it into the business as usual activity. You need to surround yourself by the right subject matter experts. They need to be brought in very early on in the process. 
You might need to lean on your legal teams, design, technical, security, and data teams to be able to help you uh, have the right information to make really good choices and decisions. Another aspect to that is expectations management. So making sure you've got the right partners in place and you are, you are very clear in your communications with the internal stakeholders. The next question I was asked to respond to was about how do you do this if you've got a constrained budget? And we know in a post COVID world, budgets will be incredibly tight and innovation and entrepreneurship is often seen as a nice to have instead of a core business element. But having no budget or limited budget is not excuse not to innovate. You can do it on a shoestring. In the past, I've really had to work very hard at this in terms of seeking alternate funding sources. For example, you might be able to seek government assistance in terms of uh, standing up ideas and propositions. You might be able to seek sponsorship from your uh, partnering organisations to offset some of your costs. What I've been able to do is access lots of talent and resources from the universities uh, through the schools of business, economics, law and psychology and inviting those students to come and work with me to be able to stand up many ideas and propositions uh, without uh, incurring costs of FTE. There's ways of reducing costs in terms of developing your own videos, um, looking at how you can interview and hold workshops uh, for human-centred design activities without going through very expensive sourcing firms to do so. And the final element to that is really leverage your network, making sure that you call upon the assistance that you need uh, from pe key people internally and externally to your organisations. It is possible to work without resources in innovation, but don't let anyone tell you that it's fun. It's hard work. One of the challenges, particularly for women, is that we don't ask for what we need. We fill the gaps by working harder, rather than actually being really specific about what you need, being really clear about the return on investment, having a solid business case, and demonstrating why your leader should invest in the ideas that you want to take forward. The return on investment should be considered broadly, not just financial return, but it could be brand, reputation, shareholder value, or being part of a global citizen. I wanted to share about how might you create an ideal career within your organisation uh, to ensure everybody wins. I just wanted to share sort of my personal journey uh, of innovation as an entrepreneur. So I joined CUA about five years ago and started in a strategy and innovation role. At that time, I, I formed an innovation team and recently I've created an accelerator program called CUA Next. In my role, I lead the function I look at innovation strategy, thought leadership, and thinking about what could be next. I've developed a human-centered design capability in the business and look at how might we co-create methodology capability to ensure that we have the member in the heart of what we do. I'm responsible for the innovation journey from discovery, ideation, proof of concept, partnering, business case development, and right through to running pilot projects or proof of concepts with a commercial outcome. I also spend quite a lot of time exploring ideas with FinTech partners in the startup and scale-up communities to see how to accelerate um, opportunity through there. So how might you create your ideal career as an entrepreneur within your organisation, within your context? So it's really about understanding what are the opportunities and also the barriers for doing this? And then how might you play to your strengths? You need to be really aware of the environmental context. 
If you operate outside of this, you could be perceived as making noise or distracting people from the core business. So it's really important to be very aware of this. So if we think about the opportunities for our next normal, we need to understand the why, the why of our business and what's important to the board and to executive. Um, is it about the relevance of the organisation? Is it about sustainability? Is it about deepening the relationships with customers? Is it about attracting new members? And then very, very be clear about focusing efforts in that regard. You might want to think about creating spaces like virtual hackathons, for example, to bring people together for collaboration uh, in a way that we haven't done previously. So you might think about opportunities in terms of innovating in the core, innovating in an adjacent or in a transformational way within your business. Think about the gin distilleries who've had to exploit their unique manufacturing and distribution capability to move from just creating gin to moving to hand sanitizer. They saw a need in market, they pivoted their core business and they were they able to uh, benefit from an adjacent service delivery. Consider alternate revenue streams, looking at opportunities where you can build revenue uh, in areas that were not imagined before. Think about safe experimentation. So how might you experiment in areas of your business that are not significantly impacted by the COVID-19? And think about the speed of innovation. So many of the organisations, including ours, had to pivot to a working from home arrangement. We had to break through rigid systems and processes to be able to uh, create um, ways of rapid decision making whilst containing data and information to be as safe um, as necessary. And to see a workforce to be able to move to a full remote working from home within a matter of weeks uh, is extraordinary when we think about we had this on the roadmap for several years. And we're not alone. Many organisations had to pivot very quickly to achieve this. But it just shows that with enough strong stimulus, things can change rapidly. And this gives us confidence in terms of how innovation might be sustained beyond the crisis. So in terms of barriers in innovation, you need to make sure that governance is what I call minimum viable governance. So you don't want to over-engineer the amount of governance required early on when you're ideating as an entrepreneur. You need to have the right size of governance. You need to be able to understand and engage with risk. It is one of the most important elements to be very clear about the risk that you are undertaking, to document that clearly and to be able to describe that to others. The second point is about an ambidextrous organisation. You may have read this article, and if you haven't, I, I recommend you do. It's about getting the balance between running the business, the everyday core business, whilst creating space in the organisation for innovation and design. And it's about the balance between both of those activities, which is really important as we move out of COVID-19. The final area here is about product market fit. It's about being able to experiment, to be able to test and learn and to fail fast and fail cheap. We need to learn if, not, if a product is not hitting its initial level of interest or ongoing level of interest, that we can turn it off. We can switch it off early and we can save costs and effort by being very upfront about what our uh, experiment hypothesis was. If it doesn't meet it, then we switch it off and have strong criteria to be able to justify those decisions. So if we want to have a successful career as an entrepreneur, there's two sides to success. One is uh, to be successful, the corporate culture needs to be conducive to that concept. Many entrepreneurs fail, not because they didn't have great ideas, um, but it was really that the corporate environment wasn't suited up to be receptive to entrepreneurship. So corporates need to have the following characteristics. They need to be open to ideas from their staff. They need to foster a way for cross-collaboration. Cross they need to 
understand the attitudes and opinions of the customers and to deeply listen to those and create an environment where people feel free to and empowered to speak up um, and to be able to have a fund uh, for R&D and experimentation uh, when great ideas come forward. And also to create a learning environment where it encourages not only creativity, but the right capability um, within the organisation. On the other side of the coin, it's about a range of personal characteristics for people to be successful as entrepreneurs. A successful entrepreneur seeks out opportunities where other people may not see them. They need to be really good at communication. They need to be able to sell their idea with conviction. They need to feel okay with ambiguity because that is a constant in this type of role. And be really good at engaging and understanding risk. They need to be passionate about change and curious in their pursuit. They need to establish a strong network, both internally and externally, to expand thinking and to challenge their perspective and need to be a great team player. In closing, when we turn our thinking towards entrepreneurship in a world post COVID-19, we need to focus on two things, both regeneration and acceleration. When we have the right balance of the organisational climate, the right entrepreneurial talent, we have the potential to innovate for products and services that will be great for our members' experience or our customers' experience. And these opportunities are almost limitless in a post-COVID world. I just wanted to thank Holly, Carly, and the Women in Digital team for asking me to come and share my thoughts today about entrepreneurships. I'd now, now like to hand back and we can open this up for some questions. Thank you for your time. Alrighty, I am back and Melissa is on with us as well. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I can, Carly. Beautiful. Thank you so much for doing that presentation, Melissa. It was amazing. You've had a quick costume change, but you're in the same. <laughs> nice to be live with you here. <laughs> yeah. um, so we do have some questions. So um, we had some pre-submitted. So we'll start with those, but we've also had a couple um, come through during the presentation. So Melissa, where do you see your career going next? So being an innovation and on entrepreneur is a relatively new career path. Um, so it would be really interested to know your perspective of what that career progression looks like for someone in this field and also in this field at your level. Yeah, great. So um, I, I guess to give a bit of context, so uh, I started my career looking at things like business process for engineering, spent some time as project manager, uh, and then change management or portfolio change, moved into an area of business transformation uh, and, and organisational capability and design. Uh, and then that's really led me to um, understand, you know, very early on when innovation was just starting to become a thing, um, to, to focus on, well, it, it's a logical jump from business transformation into innovation. Um, and so uh, from there, I had a, that combined strategy innovation role and um, could actually see some great leaders in the organisation who had a mindset um, that was interested in, in innovation. Um, and so, you know, really lobbied for a role to say, can I focus solely on, on that piece of work, wow. um, which has been fantastic in terms of being able to then uh, shape um, the role that I'm currently in, which is um, the head of digital innovation. Um, uh, in, in terms of what's next, there's quite a few different path, pathways that you can choose. So uh, in some of the larger corporates, there's a chief innovation officer role or CINO or CHINO, as I like to call it. Um, in uh, Queensland Avenue Utilities, they've got a Chief Opportunity Officer, which I really like the sound of because it, it really is very much in a, a positive mindset. Um, you could then also go in the entrepreneurial road, so actually just set up a, a small business or a startup and, and go down that, that route, um, depending on um, your level of risk appetite. Uh, certainly, it's, it's great being inside in a corporate organisation because you can work at the speed of entrepreneurs. Um, but you have the safety of um, and security of a, a, you know, a regular job and, a, and a, an income, um, not having to eat baked beans like many of the uh, early startups have to do. 
Um, you could go into the solopreneur, uh, which is a, a emerging uh, um, capability. Uh, that you're seeing a lot if you have a read at the moment, people are moving into that when they're, they're um, displaced from, from roles. Um, and the other piece is into academia, so whether or not uh, that's of interest too in terms of lecturing in the School of, of Innovation. So yeah, and, and then for me personally, I'd really like um, to move into board roles uh, yeah. because it's about being able to influence organisations at those highest levels to say how might they move forward um, through innovation pathways. Yeah, which you've, because you want to move into boards, you've just started studying, haven't you? Yes, my first uh, lecture was last night with the AICD, so uh, so it's been great. It's almost like an MBA on on steroids in that uh, you, you're really learning very quickly uh, about uh, the governance of uh, organisations. I think that's really pivotal too. Like, there's never a stage in your career you're not learning. Like, if you want to progress to the next stage, you've got to put the time and the work in as well. So that's definitely something to take home as well. Um, on to the next question. I would like to know how, I'd like to know about how to affect the personal pivot that you have done um, to be where you are today. Yeah, look, for me, it's all about um, the mindset, all about the mindset of, of the leader that you work for or the one that you aspire to work for. And you can really see it may be the CEO of an organisation, it might be a senior leader who just really gets this stuff. So by, by getting it, I mean, they might have a growth mindset. Um, if you're familiar with some of the work by um, Carol Dewerk, D-W-E-R-K, she's out of Stanford and she talks about this concept of growth mindset. Definitely worth a read uh, if it's a new concept to you, but um, essentially it talks about you know, it's somebody who has an optimistic mindset, who's very resilient in, in, in times of challenge, uh, who, who's open to feedback, you know, it's those types of qualities. And so um, to be able to choose individuals and organisations uh, to, to become a part of. It also might mean you need to pivot industries. So in my example, um, you know, working in a government space, I didn't get enough exposure to commercialisation. And I thought, well, we're better to get that than actually in a, a banking and financial institution. And, uh, and I definitely have it in spades now. <laughs> um, what characteristics do you look for in ideas and projects when you're assessing feasibility? Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, three characteristics, feasibility, desirability, viability. Um, and feasibility, to me, I just think, think of it simply as, can we actually do this? So is it technically sound? You know, um, does it rely on APIs? Where will um, the data be stored? Uh, it's about making sure that do you have the right resources, the right skills and capability to be able to get um, the idea from concept through to a, a minimum bubble product or a prototype. Do you have the right partners in place? Um, and uh, do you uh, have, um, are you allowed to do it from a legal and a regulatory uh, perspective? And so there's many considerations when you're trying to assess um, the feasibility of an idea. Beautiful. So those were the pre-submitted questions done, and I think they were great answers. Um, now moving to the live questions. So Katie would like to know, um, can Melissa talk about push and pull factors that drive the problem identification process? Yeah, Katie, that's a really good question. So um, my experience has been when I've come to when I came to this role uh, five years ago, it was very much set up as a a uh, push process in that I had an ideas box, it was a spreadsheet of 1,000 great ideas from the business. Some of them hadn't been looked at for 12 months or two years and so it only led to disappointment for the people that had submitted the ideas and they never went anywhere. Um, another example might be if you've got a piece of technology looking for a problem and I think I've got Rosie on the phone at the moment here. Um, she's uh, been instrumental in, in this piece of work but um, in working on looking at technology such as AI and machine learning, sometimes you can be pushed in terms of trying to find a problem to solve. So you want to use the technology, but you're looking for a problem in the business. Um, but the flip side of that is a pull uh, approach to um, problem identification. And so for that, you know, it speaks to me is that, you know, what's the most important problem to solve either strategically in the business or within a business unit? and really focusing in on, on those problems, looking for a range of, of solutions in terms of your ideation approach. Having that um, divergent, the convergent and divergent thinking, going through um, a process of human-centered design activity, right through to developing the prototype, uh, getting it out in market, testing that, and then to scale. So 
So, um, so look, I think I've tried both approaches. I think from a, um, being able to get um, organisational support, funding and traction, um, certainly uh, the pool approach has been uh, more successful um, in, in my recent experiences. Beautiful. And this is actually a question for Rosie. Where have you seen amazing innovation culture nationally and internationally? And can you describe what these companies are doing so well? Yeah, oh, thanks, Rosie, for your question. Um, so from my perspective, you, know, you, you can read a lot about some of the great organisations. So, you know, the Googles of the world, Microsoft, um, those types of organisations. So, for example, Google, they offer up to 20% um, of time uh, for an, an internal uh, person to be able to work on their idea or their side hustle. Um, and as I said before, you know, time to innovate is so important. Um, and and, and we, we've done that too in terms of um, being able to encourage our people to look at um, an idea that they have, maybe it's come from a hackathon, to encourage them to, to work on that idea and then um, to be able to re retain the IP of that idea and then potentially pitch it to the organisation later down the track. So, you know, that was just you know, a couple of examples. Um, so the other, other piece which is interesting in those organisations is that they remunerate people for um, those ideas that, that are special. So um, yeah, it, it's an interesting um, technique in terms of being able to change up just the normal payroll structure to be able to provide incentives and bonuses for coming up with the next big idea for the organisation. Uh, just a final resource there would be Spotify. So if you've read any of the work here, they've organise themselves in terms of agile teams into tribes. Um, it's a really interesting case study and model in terms of how you might um, build capability and capacity to be able to innovate in interesting ways yeah. and create a great innovation culture. There's definitely a lot to go away and research after this presentation. Mm. <laughs> we are going to leave it there. I would like to give Melissa a big virtual round of applause. Thank you so much. I know you're such a busy woman and you have so generous generously given up your time not today but over the past two weeks to make this happen um and i know that everyone's definitely walking away with valuable valuable ideas from that um so thank you again for spending your friday morning with us it is always my favorite time every fortnight and we look forward to staying connected on socials and one more big thank you to melissa thank you so much thanks carly it's been a pleasure to be with you all today uh, any further questions, just throw them on LinkedIn. I'll be really happy to connect with you uh, on those. Awesome. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much. See you later.